Hello and uh, welcome to the 13th edition of the Beldox International Documentary Film Festival. My name is Igor Stanojevic, I am the curator of the festival and uh, with me today are Elza Kremzer and Levine Peter, directors of Space Dogs. Hello. Hi. Hello. So my first question would be uh, what was the genesis of the whole project and how did it come to be? In the very beginning, we, we had the idea to make a film about a pack of stray dogs. But it was not yet the idea of including the story of Laika. We came up in the first weeks of our research when we thought about another layer for the film. Um, and, and back then, it was not yet decided to which city we go to follow this pack of strays. So as soon as we found out that Laika actually was born on the streets of Moscow, we had the place where we wanted to go. And so this myth came up about her, return, her ghost returning to the streets of Moscow. And yeah, we ourselves went on our first research trips uh, with this idea, first time in Russia for us back then, to find a pack we want to film. It's a very impressive film visually. It's uh, it's quite it, it's quite stunningly filmed, and uh, from as best as I can tell, uh, all the parts that you filmed yourselves were filmed from the dog's point of view or like dog's height. So could you tell me a little bit about how you de developed a uh, a visual signature for the for the film? Yeah, this was very initial idea. I mean, as soon as as we had like the plan, like as I said, that we that we want to dedicate 90 minutes to to a pack of stray dogs, we immediately thought uh, we want to put the the audience into into their eye level, into the position where you find yourself for for a feature length film in the middle of a pack. And this came from yeah from a very simple feeling that, that we in an early stage wanted to create. I don't know, you can name it an anti animal or anti-environment film because we were not satisfied with with seeing our environment in, in this like BBC documentaries or Netflix where everything is, is always very exotic and we, we find ourselves in a safe place at home at our couch and uh, we are watching something that comes with the atmosphere as if this would be another planet and not not the planet that we actually share with all the with all the wildlife. So we thought it's a technical question that we need to we need to do a break, a very strong break. We don't want it to be in a distance. We don't never wanted to use drones or very fancy um, yeah ways of of exploring the wildlife. We we really wanted to do it different and really put the audience into this situation that is not really comfortable where where you are down on this level that you don't know maybe you know it from your childhood that was another thing we had in mind that when you grow up the dogs when you encounter a dog is sometimes the the sight uh, yeah or the, the same height so in the moment that we become older, our view on animals is automatically changing because we look down to them. And also this was, um, was an idea to, to come back to this childish perspective. So the, the world that we see these, these dogs living in, the way that you show it to us, uh, it's sort of very, um, it's very cruel, it's dark, it's uh, desolate, it feels it feels almost post-apocalyptic. I mean, most of the time you don't even see any humans, uh, uh, only very occasionally, a few times, and then you just see these broken down cars and these desolate areas and garbage dumps. Uh, was this also part of the original sort of, uh, you know, worldview that you try to relate, or is this something that you encountered sp spontaneously while uh, filming? Actually, we have been very interested in the very beginning how their look on us humans uh, is and what they actually see and what, uh, which part of the human cities they are actually inhabiting. And yeah, so with this idea of putting the camera down and following them in their most active times and when they conquer the city, which is actually at night, uh, Moscow turned out to be quite an empty city. 
at four o'clock in the morning, there's not much, not much left of the of the busy city. We we also recognize during the day. Um, yeah, and obviously this contrast uh, fascinated us in the very early research when we uh, did not yet know what stray dogs are doing the whole day except from sleeping, what you see often. And when we first time came in four in the morning um, and observed the pack who is really uh, filling the streets and it's their city in this moment, this we enjoyed a lot. And places which we, which we found was actually really led by them. We always wanted to explore the city with them and together with them. So we were letting us go and just following them where they lead us. And yeah, these, these are these cars and these strange places you maybe not go to as a, as a human when you visit Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's obvious that in these parts of the city where, part, uh, where the city is falling apart, uh, there's much more space for them, they feel safer and, and there's much more for them to explore. There's much more space and uh, old cars to, to hide in. So it's, it's in every part of Moscow where we found dogs, the, the city was ending. The human control came, came to an end. This is also the reason why, why the city looks like this in Orphia. I mean, that's, that's what it feels like. And especially nowadays that many cities in the world have curfews and uh, empty, empty streets at night. Um, it's, it's also kind of a very good film for this, for this moment because it sort of shows you this potential world without, without people. But I'm also interested, you started talking a little bit about it. What did like a, a day of filming look like? Uh, did you follow them for a day? Could, um, I mean, were you able to find the same dog later on or did you... You know, how did, how did that work out? I mean, we found out, as, as I said early, that their most active time starts, let's say, at 2, 3 o'clock in summer. So In the morning. Yeah, in the morning. And also in the night. So we knew in night they are active, let's say, until 6 or 7. So, yeah, we decided to, to start in the night um, and to follow them until six or seven. So this was a normal shift. Um, I mean, we were lucky because most of the, of the packs and also the one we filmed, they have, a, yeah, they have a very, they have always the same place to sleep. They, they kind of have a small area where they, where they always return. And yeah, so we slept during the day, we woke up late, then we started to drive there and very often they were, they were there. And then they started with us, their new day. And if they've been away, then we waited for, for some time and... Or we found them come. at the bar. Yeah, <laughs> or we found them. At this club. Or very often we came and they were still sleeping and then they, they recognized us, but they were like too tired or too lazy or not interested in us. And then we, we had to wait very often for hours until they finally like started to, to do something. So I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure everybody asks you this question every time you do a Q&A, which is about the, the cat scene, shall we, shall we call it? How did that come about? And... Uh, what were your feelings and emotions during it? And what went through your mind? And did you ever consider not putting it in the film or putting it in the film? Yeah, actually it was uh, regarding the emotion we had during the shooting. It was a special moment in our process uh, in following the pack because it was the morning it happened. It's really a very continuous scene in the film. It happened like that when they, when this uh, big party with these dancers cracking these balloons. So this is all chronological, how you see it in the movie. It's not the big montage thing. Um, so this was kind of the feeling of after six weeks of shooting that we managed the first time to really follow them, that they don't run away too much from us. So it was, uh, yeah, we were enjoying this morning so much and we followed and followed and they, they waited a bit for us, so we were able to film the way we always wished for, for weeks and worked on a very long time. And actually, when this situation happened, it was, in a way, I suppose, uh, 
a bit the same like it's now for the spectator in the in the cinema when you watch the film it was super shocking and totally out of nowhere it was really surprising us and shocking us in a horrible way and then we just did what we were training all these weeks which is to follow and continue what we what we always tried so we filmed that it was uh, not a moment of of intellectualizing during it happened it was a very automatic reaction to continue and mm -hmm. follow and not to, to interrupt or break the shooting um even if we've been shocked and we've been yeah like hiding behind the fence living in me and we've been split up a bit and it was a very tough situation but um afterwards was a even a more crucial moment in the evening when we talked to the team and discussed the situation because we've been all quite uh yeah, in a way, uh, not calm anymore. It was really strange. And our feeling towards this main dog totally changed because we started to hate him for a moment after this happened. Like, you motherfucker, how can you do that? And we didn't want to touch him anymore, which we did before. Because we, yeah, we somehow it was so horrible for us too. And then we discussed so much how, why we put our moral standards so much on them when they actually act like their nature is and what they do to survive and not just to survive but which is their wilder wild inner selves or something like that yeah so this was very very crucial to the whole development of the film because in this moment we understood that they got the control in this moment of, of the situation and they just show us how they live and so also during editing there was never a question if, if the scene um should not be part of it this was directly after the shooting clear for us because it changed us during the making of the film and our view on the dogs a lot, that we really accepted them as animals, as wild animals, and not as something we can control. So it was clear it should be part of the film. Just the main thing was really tough in editing to find the right positioning, that this scene actually gets uh, this impression or this uh, meaning that, that it can change the view on them. That's why we put it so early, to understand very early and break with the image of we, that one might have of a dog. Yeah, it's sort of the, the sort of, shall we say, the beginning of the second act a little bit. Yeah. Like, because the, in the beginning, everything is very sort of more peaceful and quiet and we just follow their daily lives. And then there's this big, big shock. And then it reminds you that they are not human protagonists and that uh, they don't have you know, when you're filming humans for a documentary, they will maybe not do some things that they would normally do. But when it comes to dogs, they don't care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So an another interesting thing uh, is that you have, uh, besides this portion that you filmed with the uh, dogs of uh, present day Moscow, you also have quite a lot of, um, I'm assuming, archival footage uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about, is this uh, authentic documentary footage? How did you come by this? Because it's quite amazing. Uh, all, all, of, all of this archival stuff is really, really quite stunning and uh, beautifully filmed. Uh, and it really fits well with, with the, the rest of your film. Yeah, I mean, everything that you've seen in the film, all, almost all of the archive footage is, uh, is the first time shown to the public. Um, especially all the, all the crucial images and, and for example, the images when you see the dogs when they were released from the, from the capsule um, and when all these scientists and doctors like working on, on their bodies. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a very long way. It took three years in total to get access to it. It was never a question of money. Uh, it was much more a question of building a relationship to the people who were responsible for this material and who were hiding it. Um, yeah, I mean, it took, let's say, three years to... to we were able to tell them that it's the right decision to give it 
into our head to releasing this, this material. Culture is also they were partly scientists, and and we are not so finding the the right language to that they are understanding what we do and that we understand their position. This this was tough. How did you even how did you even find out about this this footage? I mean, we we had to do a long research. We we were even in different countries because. This material in the 90s was so widely spread and, and this is why we also searched in, in Ukraine, for example, but we were, we were never really successful. We, we very often had the moment that we are too late. Maybe it's destroyed, maybe it disappeared and we just found tiny pieces, but we always wanted to, to be in this position that we find really the raw material that we see the flash of the of the camera and that we see no it's original it's authentic we wanted to have have it proven also and um we very early we found out that the, the same institute where the dogs were trained this institute is still existing we were told yeah they have this forgotten and, and very old raw material but then we we were very close like in the system and then we found out it's, it's really tough them to, to release it. Yeah, actually we tried all different facilities or institutions who was back then working with the dogs. So it was like uh, there was an institution who made the, the space suits for the dogs, there was the, the, the biological institution who made the tests and the, the scientific research, then there was the, the company who they built or the institute who built the rockets, the, we met the guy who made the camera installments inside the rockets and yeah, so there were many different institutions involved back then and we asked basically all of them um, if they know if they have material or if they know where it went because in classical archives we didn't find anything or just the very few images which are known from TV documentaries which are in any news or some propaganda material. But so this, this was the access through the institute who, who treated the dogs biologically. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting because when you're watching the film and it starts in, in reality, shall we say, or in, in the stuff that you filmed, and then it seems very bleak. And then when the archival footage starts, uh, the viewer maybe assumes that this material is going to be maybe more glamorous or kind of... Uh, sort of a more of a movie uh, version of reality but then as soon as they start grafting different things onto the dogs and you know doing all of these things to them and you know later on when you see the dogs with all of their fur sort of burned mm -hmm. off i'm assuming from the you know friction of the rocket or whatever um and then you realize that actually even this because you have this sort of a reality versus mythology, but even when you look at the mythology, it's just as cruel. Yeah. I mean, is this, is this also something that you sort of anticipated or did this come about as you were gathering the materials? Oh, I mean, also before we, we discussed a lot that this institute and especially the images that you see Everything is so sterile and clean and without any signs of, of life. It, to us, it was also like, it reminded us on early science fiction. Mm. So interesting that it's, it, it never really felt real to us, like, like in the sense of, of reality, something that you can imagine that is happening on the world. It's much more our projection towards the future. And it's still like this. Yeah. And it was back then in the future. So this, this anticipation of, of what the future might bring to our planet it is still the same and it's, it's like conserved in, into these images and the dogs inside this institute for us always were the only, the only part that, that brought like, uh, yeah, life and, and, and movement into it and in comparison to the and it's it's again dark but still there was the movement there was this was lively and, and this this felt real so we, we liked that we can turn it upside down and that this documentary images in the archive which is normally like seen like a historic image chronological images 
in our film it's it's totally different and, and this this is what we wanted mm. to 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 do very early and I was also wondering about the narration. Was that always the idea? And, and how did you decide to have these particular passages? And how did you decide to have it in, uh, in Russian? Yeah, in the super early stage, uh, we thought it's a, it's a film without any word, without language, and uh, humans are totally aside. But obviously, with the story of Laika, we realized we want to tell uh, a lot um, Actually, it's important with this myth because this uh, the legend of Laika coming back was uh, it, like drawing even us so much into it during the shooting. It was was such an important thing to walk through this city and film those dogs with the intention that it might be Laika's ghost somewhere here. So um, this soon combined uh, the two layers a lot for us. And we always wanted to make a film which is dealing with uh, magic realism. And it was clear for us to, that our goal was to break the view on animals uh, and the narration of are we, what, were you, uh, what we are used to, to see in movies, which is putting clear um, objectives on dogs or on animals in general, like Disney or BBC documentaries where everything is explained about how they feel and which characters they have. So with this uh, use of fairy tale style in our narration, we wanted to, to break this um, together with the images you actually see with the documentary characters and the, the wildness of these animals you just observe. So this was an aesthetic idea before we, we had before the shooting. And yeah, Russian felt in a way very, very clear to us that it should be in Russian because this whole storytelling about the space talks and about whole the space flight um, is so anchored there. And we talked to many scientists who were back then involved in, in the space program and who even gave us some diaries and we, we could read some um, science diaries from, from back then. So we used all also some language parts they had used in their notes and combined this with this mythological way of storytelling and fairy tale storytelling. Okay, uh, I would, I mean, do you maybe have some uh, parting thoughts for, for, the, for the viewers of your film? Or anything to add? Not really. Not really. I, I, <laughs> not really. <laughs> I think it was uh, like through, through the main aspects of, of our thoughts behind the film. Um, no, there's nothing coming directly to my mind. Too. Uh, in that case, I just want to thank you for, uh, for this conversation. Oh, there's a dog walking yeah. by just behind me. That's why I just... <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you for, for this conversation. And uh, I want to thank you for your amazing film, which sort of uh, at first mm -hmm. glance seems very simple, but leaves us a lot of space for all kinds of different thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you. Yeah. Yeah, hope to see you in Belgrade. <laughs> <laughs>